far away, stood in the whole rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for the lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. Though I'll cherish the old bugging cross till my trophies at last I'd lay down. Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old cross. I will ever be true in shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for Church, welcome to our second message in our Defeating Your Giant series. And today, our giant we're defeating is going to be worry. Our scripture text is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. So turn with me in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 6. What a better way to face the giant of worry than to find out what Jesus was talking about when he tells us in this Sermon on the Mount not to worry. 
But before we look at those instructions, there's two things that I want to tell you that we're not talking about today. Because when Jesus says, don't worry, he's not talking about two things. And first of all, he's not talking about don't plan. Because sometimes I hear people talk, tell me about this passage when it, and they believe that when Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, that he means that we shouldn't even plan for tomorrow. But Jesus planned. He planned not only for his ministry, but he planned for his ministry after his death and his resurrection. And in the New Testament, we're even told not to even enter a project without counting the costs. So when we talk about not worrying here, and Jesus says, don't worry, he's not saying don't plan. And second, he's not saying don't ever be concerned about anything. For instance, I hear people say that when it says in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, that they mean just to have a carefree cavalier spirit where you don't even think about anything. Just be loose and carefree. That's not what it means. The bottom line is that we are to be concerned about things. I mean, if you see your child or your grandchild out playing in the yard where traffic is, you'd be concerned. And your concern will motivate you to action. And that's a good thing because you can preserve your child from getting hurt. That's a legitimate concern. And we're not talking about that. Because there's a difference between worry and concern. And let me tell you in a very simple way what the difference is. Worry has to do with the future that we have no control over. And concern has to do with the present, and there are usually some things that we can do in the present to take care of the problem. So we're not talking about not planning, and we're not talking about not having any concern. But we are talking about letting a spirit of worry take control of your life. And as we examine the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 6, Beginning with verse 25, we're going to learn some very important instructions. Instructions that will help us understand how worry affects us and what we're to do about it. The passage is really divided into two sections, verses 25 through 32 and then verses 33 through 34. And in the first section, in facing the giant of worry, the Lord Jesus reminds us of several things that are true about worry. In the 25th verse, he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and your body more than clothes? So the first thing Jesus is telling us is that worry is inconsistent. It just doesn't make sense. For the whole concept of the 25th verse is that since God has provided for us our life, if he has given us our body, does it not make sense that he would also care for the things that we need for the body. In essence, the argument is from the greater to the lesser. If he provided for the great need that we have, which is our life in the organism that we know as our body, would he not also give us the lesser things, which is to put food in our body or clothes on our body or shelter over our body? So Jesus is saying that it's inconsistent for us to worry when we already understand and we already have evidence of God's goodness in the very life that we lead. Don't be inconsistent and take your life for granted and then worry about the incidental things that enhance it. Worry is not only inconsistent, but according to the word of God in the very next verse, number two, worry is irrational. Because it says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more, more valuable than they? Because if we bought into the logic of the first statement that Jesus made in the first verse, and we believe that since we have life, he's going to provide for us the needs of that life, and that he's able to do it, the question that would come to our mind is, I know God is able to do this, but will he? And here in this second argument that Jesus presents, he teaches us that worry is very irrational. We have the exact opposite of way of arguing. In the first verse, Jesus argued from the lesser to the greater. In this verse, he goes from life to clothes. 
In this verse, he goes from the birds of the air to the human being. And he's saying, if God Almighty will provide for the birds of the air, don't you think he'd provide for you? I mean, doesn't that make sense? So here, Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater. And of course, the answer is, of course, if he cares intimately for the birds of the air, sure, he's going to care for those who have much greater value to him. After all, we were created in his image. That's you and me. So don't worry. Thirdly, Jesus not only says worry is inconsistent and irrational, but it's ineffective. In the 25th verse, he asks a very interesting question. Can any one of you add worry? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I mean, think about that. Which of us by worrying can add a moment to our life, not even just a minute to our longevity? Of course, the answer is nobody. Now, if Jesus had asked, can we subtract a year from our life by worrying? There we'd have a good answer. I have a sneaking suspicion that there are cemeteries filled with graves all over the land. Graves of believers who have cheated God out of five to ten years of their life just because they worried themselves into an early grave. So worry is ineffective. And one of the reasons we don't want to worry, according to Jesus, is that it doesn't do any good. It doesn't make any difference. When we worry about things that are going to happen tomorrow, we not only ruin today, but we also ruin tomorrow. Worry doesn't rob tomorrow of its sorrow, it robs today of its strength. So that we lose both today and tomorrow when we worry, and we don't accomplish anything at all by doing it. That's the reasoning of Jesus. And the answer is to understand and to think through and to recognize that worry doesn't really accomplish anything. It's inconsistent, it's irrational, it's ineffective, and then in verses 28 to 30, we learn that it's illogical. The verses 28 to 30, as I read them, says, Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Now the argument that Jesus is using is saying, look around at nature. Look around at what you can see with your eyes and recognize that if God cares for the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, we're eternal. God gave us his son. He paid the price for our eternal redemption. Does it not make sense that God would take such incredible care of the lilies of the field and then let us go without any concern? The answer is obviously no. It's not logical to think that way. The God of the heaven who beautifies this world with his creative touch also cares for his children. And it's illogical to think any other way. The final reason Jesus gives us when we're facing this giant of worry is not work for worrying is it's just a little bit harsh. It's a little stiff. But just remember, I'm reading this from the word of God. It's not just my opinion. Because the last thing Jesus wants us to not only know about worry is that it's inconsistent, irrational, ineffective, and illogical, but it's irreligious. Notice what he says in verse 31 and 32. He says, so do not worry by saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Jesus is saying, when we worry, we forget who we are. He says, when you worry, you act like pagans. Worry is not Christian. Worry is irreligious. Worry is acting like you don't have a father in heaven and a family on this earth. Worry is acting like God is not able to care for you. See, pagans worship idols that don't see or hear and can't even handle any of their requests, like the ones that they're worshiping. And when we worry, we act as if God is like that. And Jesus says, don't worry, because when you worry, you're not acting in a very Christian way. Does that mean that Christians don't have momentary concerns or worries? Not at all. We can visit worry, but don't stay there. Some people I know don't visit worry, they just move in. They let worry become their lifestyle. They worry themselves sick, and then they worry about 
things that they don't have anything to worry about. And Jesus is saying, when we worry like that, we're acting as if we don't even believe that our Heavenly Father knows that you need the things that you need. So Jesus says that when you worry, when you face worry, what you need to do is sit down for a moment and think through what worrying really is. Worrying is dwelling on the future that you don't have any control over. It's spending all of your energies on thinking what might happen tomorrow until you have no energy to deal with the issues of today. And now in the last two verses, Jesus reminds us of how we're to defeat this giant of worry. He tells us in these last two verses, there are two things that we're going to need if we're going to get over worry, if we're going to face this giant and defeat it. And I know that some of us are prone to worry. So how do we defeat worry if it's an issue in our life? Let me give you two thoughts. First of all, to win over worry, we need a system of priorities in our life. Notice what Jesus says in verse 33. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Much of the worry that destroys people is the worry that's divided heart. And what that means is a divided heart which cannot decide what it's going to live for. A divided heart gets caught up in all the things of the material possessions of the day. And it's interesting that this passage on worry is right in the center of a passage in the New Testament that has to do with personal possessions. And Jesus is saying what you need to do first, first of all, to fight against worry, is to get your system of priorities in order. To sit down and set in place what you really believe what you're really committed to. And he says, here's how you go about doing it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Put that at the very heart of who you are. Let that be the lens to who you look through in every area of our life. And just understand that when you do that, all of these other things will be added as well. How many of you know that that just totally works? How many of you can say amen to that, that it's true? That when you put God at the center of your life, when you make him the focus of all your pursuits, then and only then can you enter into life with enthusiasm. And you don't have to worry about all the what ifs on the other side because you've settled the big issue. God is going to take care of all the other issues that come along. But it's a sad thing to see how many of God's people put God off to this side of their life and believe that sometimes our worry is more of a worry born out of the realization that we violated this priority. That we recognize we should be living in a different way and that worries us. And we continue to worry and it just becomes a cycle that we can't break. Let me tell you, the first thing you need to do if you're prone to worry is to step back for a moment and say, how have I ordered my life? What is the important thing to me? And when we do that, we'll discover that God puts you first in dealing with the worries of your life. The second thing we can do, and it's found in this last verse of the passage of scripture, and all of the things that I've ever read about worry, this is maybe the most important and critical thing to do. We not only need a system of priorities, but we need a strategic program. And here's the program. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Listen carefully. No one has ever sank under the burden of today. But many people sink under the burden of today when they add the burden of tomorrow along with it. What the Bible is teaching us and what Jesus is telling us is that we need to learn how to live in day tight compartments so that every day is only what we face. Not that we don't plan for tomorrow or not that we might not have concerns about this or that, but we don't live there. We live for today. Several years ago, there was this article by a famous physician and he made some wise observations about worry and having dealt with people who were struggling with the physiological ramifications of worry in their life. He said that, you know, 
ocean liners are built in such a way that they have these steel doors on the hold of the ship and they're able to be lowered by the press of a button so that even if the hull of the ship is pierced through a disaster of some sort, they can lower the steel door and close off the hull so that only a portion of the ship floods. And then he went on to make this important application. He said, in the journey of life, it's critical for us to learn how to lower the door against the tomorrows that could come and destroy your life. And then how to learn how to lower the doors against the yesterdays that can cause you to worry. And when we learn how to live in just this compartment of today, that's what Jesus says. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. And there's this powerful verse in Deuteronomy 33, verse 25, and it says, as your days, so shall your strength be. So let me just share with you what I've learned. Tomorrow, God will give you the grace for what you need to do tomorrow. Today, he'll give you the grace for what you need for today. But don't ask God for today's grace to be used up in tomorrow's problems. Because you'll have enough grace for tomorrow for what you need. And we'll have to learn to take one day at a time. That doesn't mean that you're able to dismiss the thoughts of everything else, but you just don't dwell on them. You don't let those things eat at you. You just know that when tomorrow comes, you'll get out of bed and you'll get started and you're going to have what you need for tomorrow because God will give you that for that day. If you can learn to live like that, you can make worry go away. So what do we need to do? We need to pull down that door that shuts off our tomorrows. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorry. Sorrow, worry empties today of its strength. That's what happens when we worry. Mark Twain once said, I'm an old man and I've known such many great troubles, but most of them never happened. So what Jesus is telling us is this, don't worry about tomorrow. He's telling us take each day as it comes to give our attention to what God is doing right now and to not worry about the future. And then the next thing he says is to shut out our yesterdays because I've discovered that a lot of people worry about yesterday. Yesterday's gone. Why worry about yesterday? I've noticed that people usually worry about three things in their yesterdays. First of all, they worry about their sins because sometimes people come to Christ out of a terrible background, or maybe they've come to Christ and they've lived in a good home, but they violated the principles of that home and went on this long journey away from the Lord. And then when they get things right, they come back to him and they say, Pastor, you know what? I just can't get things out of my mind, the things I did before I got right with the Lord. I can't get them out of the mind. And I like to remind them, if God has forgiven them, that if he has taken their sins, has put them as far as the east is from the west, and he's buried them in the deepest sea, and that they're forgiven. And often, though, I have people say, I know that God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And so we worry about the things we've done. And in reality, what we're saying is we have a higher standard than God. God says, I can forgive you, but we can't forgive ourselves. Now, we have to put our sins where they belong, behind us. If we've confessed them, God has forgiven them. And when we choose to revisit them, we're entering an arena of worry that can destroy our life. And sometimes when we don't shut out our past, we live too long in our successes. Did you know that it's possible to do that? I don't know, maybe in an earlier part of your life, you were at the very top of your career. You had hit your stride. I mean, it's kind of like professional athletes. One of the reasons why they often have difficult times later in their life is because they reach their pinnacle early in their life. And so where do you go after that? What do you do? What, how do you learn to put your successes behind you? Paul the Apostle, one of the most successful men that ever lived, at the close of his life said, I don't count for myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, I press on toward the high calling of Christ. See, that's what we have to do. We have to take that position. If we're going to live for today, we can't be living in the successes of yesterday. 
And then thirdly, we not only have to give up our sins of yesterday and our successes of yesterday, but maybe this is the hardest one. We have to shut out our sorrows and our failures. Because you know, all of us, all along the way, before we get finished with this earth, we're gonna have sorrow or failure to deal with. It goes with the territory. Sorrow and failure cannot be forever. They need to be left behind. Even the 23rd Psalm, which is quoted in most funerals says, even though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil for you're with me. We don't walk into the valley and stay there. We walk through the valley to the other side. So we have to close the door on our tomorrows. We have to close the door on our yesterdays and we have to do what the Lord says, live for today. Make every day, this day, the most important day. God is the God of your today. God will help you deal with the problems of today. He will be there for you tomorrow, but tomorrow will be your today when you get there. I read a pretty cool sign hanging in the gas station and think carefully from this. It said, free gas tomorrow. <laughs> pretty clever, huh? I mean, some of you are out there trying to figure that out. How many of you know that when you get to tomorrow, It'll always be free gas tomorrow. See, God is the God of the ever-present now. And that's the word for our Christian life, isn't it? It's today. Live for today. Let God be the one who meets your needs today in this hour, and you'll be able to overcome worry. But before we close our Bibles, I want to leave you just with a few scriptures. I believe that can be an encouragement for you as you live for today. Some stuff you can stick in your notes. Hopefully write them on your hearts. And the first one is Psalm 50, verse 15. And it goes like this. Call on me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you. And you will glorify me. Call on me in your day of trouble. And I will deliver you. The second one is Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And the third one is 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And the last one, and the pinnacle and the mountaintop of these verses is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Don't worry about anything, Paul says, but pray about everything. The seven most important words for would-be worriers are this. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. I mean, say it out loud. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And my friends, if we do that, if we listen to the words and structure about worry from the word of God, we can face this giant of worry and defeat him. Thank you. Have a great day. Live for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Have a great day. Your love is better than all things. Your love is better than all things And I don't have the strength of words To tell you truly how I feel Oh, your love is better than life Your love is better than life Am I?